Hi, my name is Richard Bilzerbeek. In this presentation I will be giving some criticism on the national guidelines for promoting open science in Sweden. And this is a follow-up of an earlier video uh, in which I just give an overview of those guidelines in English in a more neutral fashion. So this presentation um, and also like the related uh, present like the in textual form um, it's all public domain because I care more about open science than me getting the glory. So do with it whatever you like. So I will give a short recap about the guidelines. So I will call them the guidelines um, and that's short for the thing I'll show you soon. So this was the original problem, this is the original problem that the European Union, they want open science and in Sweden there's a gap between what is done now and the ideals of open science. So the guidelines, they were developed and published exactly two months ago including a report uh, for some background and development. These were the six guidelines um, and I've already gone through them in the other presentation but just here they are. Instead, I want to focus here on the criticism. So I have four main points in which I'm going to criticize the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines. So my first point, and I'll go. The, the obvious will be that I'll say that it's quite ironic that it's only in Swedish. I will say it's unconvincing to any critical reader. I will say it's nearly no effect on the most prevalent problems in academia, and that it will create more resistance against open science. So do realize, um, the reason I only give criticism is because this is the way we decided upon at the place where I'll be giving this talk, at uh, Open Science Uppsala, the local, Upsi uh, the local open science commu community in Uppsala. So Open Science Uppsala, that's where I'll be talking, and I'll be criticizing it, where someone else will glorify it or will justify it. And in that way we try to get a discussion going. So I will only give criticism here. And maybe I don't uh, I do have solutions against all of this, or maybe I see some positive things, but that was not the purpose here. I only give criticism here. So the criticism is uh like I just said, and now we'll go into a bit more detail to try to convince you that this is 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 um is 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 valid critique. So the first point, ironically in Swedish, so let's take a look at the UNESCO website about open science, that's where it all started. Is that open science, the idea is that uh, knowledge itself is inclusive. So uh, that's a bit a bit ironic because in, so in the European Union it's in English because that's the language we use. In science we use English because that's the language well, we use, it's a lingua franca, we, ever, we use that as a common language. But if it's about science policy, we don't give a shit in which language it is. I think that's a bit weird. Um, yeah, and even after, so of course they, they promised an uh, English translation. Uh, it's exactly two months ago. Um, I could translate the thing in, uh, in uh, let's say, one minute using Google Translate. Um, so uh, I have no idea why it's still in Swedish only. And also notice that Open Science Uppsala, the Open Science Community in Uppsala, we talk in English with the goal of being inclusive, although we are in Sweden. So this is super ironic, and we can laugh about this. Uh, it is a minor point. So my second point of critique is a bit more serious, and it's that I say that this whole document, the guidelines, are unconvincing to any critical reader. So here we start with the second sentence in the guidelines, and I've converted them to English using Google Translate. This took me three seconds. Um, the purpose of the work for open science is to contribute partly to increase scientific quality, partly to improve the interaction between research and the surrounding society. It's written like that. You see how it's written in Swedish? Notice that there is completely no reference to the literature. For example, if it is to, to increase scientific quality, then all of us would think, any critical reader would think, oh yeah? Um, how do you define scientific quality? And how much does it increase? And is it worth it? There's no reference at all. Um, 
you don't know if open science actually does this yes sure we have some ideas but why don't you give me a reference to where you found this where you how you define scientific quality also the other thing to improve the interaction between research and the surrounding society how much does open science uh, actually improve this 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 interaction um, how do you define the quality of those interactions? How much did it improve in percentage point? And the industry, one of the critique on open science is that open data, especially on open data, that open data is very nice if you're in academia, but if you are like a, uh, like a company, then th there's an asymmetry because if you use open data, you should also keep it open as part of the license. Um, so open science may even harm the interaction between research and the industry. All right, again, no references, no discussion at all. It's just, bam, it's there. Um, yeah, and I've, I think it's quite unconvincing. And the final point why I think this is unconvincing, unconvincing is that within, within my open science community in Uppsala, we actually look for and we share those references in our presentations. So we uh, sometimes have a hard time finding it. That's why we show up at uh, Open Science of Sala. And now here it's just BAM! There it is, without any references. So I think this is completely unconvincing to any critical readers. It seems like more like mumbo jumbo or fanboyism here. The third point of critique is that academia has its problems, and we know which problems are most prevalent, and the guidelines have nearly no effect on those. And I'll try to convince you, I'll be using three studies to convince you that the guidelines um, no, don't solve this. So to quote the guidelines, the English translation that, is that I made using Google Translate is, the purpose of the work, the guidelines, is to contribute partly to increased scientific quality. Well, all right, so increased scientific quality, that may also mean that the problems of academia should be decreased. So here I will look at the most important problems in academia and see the effect that the guidelines have on them. Spoiler, nearly none. So I'll give you three studies that show you problems in academia and which of these are addressed by the guidelines. So I start with the first study. Uh, it's uh, it's about used as Dutch researchers. Uh, among other, Jelte Wichert uh, is, is was part of the authors. It was an anonymous survey to measure the prevalence of questionable research practices. And questionable research practices are things you probably shouldn't do. Uh, things that hurt reproducibility. Things that are not completely honest. This survey was answered correctly and successfully by nearly 7,000 Dutch researchers. And I'll really give one effect is that 2% uh, admit that they, they, they fabricated or fabricated results or committed fraud in any, other, in any way. That's 2%, that's 1 in 50. All right. You can't solve that. You can't you can solve fraud as far as I know. Um, so I'm going to ignore that. But there are things you can fix. So these are the top five most prevalent questionable research practices. And number one was that if you have a valid negative finding, so if you find nothing, it's not submitted. Whereas it should be submitted because that means other people won't do it too. It's completely unaddressed by the guidelines. 17% of all researchers don't mention regularly flaws in their study. So this may be part of the session about open methods. So they say that methods should be open and, and public and all kind of those things. But how open is that? Why? Um, like you can still leave it out, can't you? So I'm not sure if this is addressed. 15% say that they give too little supervision or they uh, they get too little supervision. No, they give too little supervision. So this is professors um, that say, well, my PhD, my postdoc, 
I supervise them too little, so that means things may creep up, there may problems arise. There's no time to properly train uh, new scientists. So 15% completely unaddressed. There's too little attention to proper use of technology. So this is also nearly 15%. And it's about fields in where you have to learn some kind of machinery, like uh, imagine microscopes. And you, like a researcher, a beginning researcher can just use it in a way that does something uh, and get publications out. Um, but there's too little attention given to the proper use of this technology. There's too little training in this. And uh, that's completely unaddressed. Now comes number five. The first thing that is addressed by the guideline is that's too little documentation of the scientific process. So that's where the, where the open methods come in and where they want this to, to be open and public and fair. Um, maybe uh, this should solve this problem that there's some kind of minimal bar being set or forced upon. Um, so this should not be a maybe, I guess. So of the five most questionable research practices, the most prevalent ones, um, we have two maybes and we have three no's. So the guidelines here they don't solve the most prevalent problems. And there's a, there are multiple studies on this. So I'm give you, going to show you the second one now. So study five uh, from uh, Minafu et al. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's called, the title is A Manifesto for Reproducible Science. So this is a manifesto for reproducible science. Um, and they also want to make science better. And it aligns closely to the KB proposal, I mean, it aligns closely to the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines are written by the Cunglia Bibliothek and KB. And, and they, they should say similar things, because both papers intend to increase reproducibility of science. That's the point they want to solve. They want to make science uh, of higher quality, and if you use reproducibility as a measure of quality, then the both papers want the same thing, and uh, more or less. There's a big overlap, at least. So let's take a look what the manifesto proposes, how to um, how to improve science. So here we see um, a cycle done in hypothesis-driven research, and the box and, and the, the manifesto gives me gives threats to reproducibility. And these threats, they mention some papers that uh, the manifesto links some papers, and I put them in boxes here. Um, this figure, you can also find it online, but there's an incorrect version of it, which has more, uh, which has higher numbers. This is, these are the correct numbers, right? So if you see, see lack of replication, one in a thousand papers, that is false. If you read the actual paper from Makel et al., you see one in a hundred papers is a replication paper, not one in a thousand. Um, so the false, the incorrect image gives a more of a makes it more murky and more dark than it actually is. It's only one in a hundred papers that is uh, reproduced. All right, so these are the threats for reproducible research. So there's uh, too little replication. The statistical power is usually too low. And p-value hacking is super prevalent. Uh, more than half of us know it. Um, there's a publication bias. That means uh, um, you don't publish everything, you don't publish your negative findings, as mentioned in the previous study too. There's a lack of data sharing, uh, it's not it's rarely shared, uh, or not very often, 50% doesn't share their data. And the last thing, harking. Harking means that you hypothesize after the results are known. So that means you've done a study, you get your results in, and then you think, hmm, this story would fit these results very well. Oh, we're going to write this beautiful story, and uh, we're going to write it up as such as that our hypothesis would be fitting that story, and then we would find what we actually hypothesized. Um, but well, you start, so, so you make up a story here, that's harking, um, it's a threat to reproducibility, because these hypotheses get more credits than they deserve uh, when they're based on a random finding. To put this in the, to see if the guidelines addresses this, um, I would say no. There's only one point, that's the lack of data sharing. So they want 
Uh, so now about 70% is not sharing their data. It's poor available research data. This is what the guidelines uh, address. They want to get this that all data is shared or at least as open as possible, as closed as needed. But addressing publication bias, not at all. Um, letting, allowing for more reproduction of uh, replications of studies, no. Um, addressing that to hypothesize after results are known, no. To use higher statistical power, not addressed. And that you should do p-value hacking, is so completely unaddressed. So here we have a second study that shows that the guidelines don't address the most important threats to reproducibility. And you could say that as, so that means it doesn't address um, how to get better quality in science, but that's the exact goal, to get better quality in science. Or the third study is a bit of a repeat of this. Um, uh, in this study they also measure questionable research practices, but then in ecology and evolution, and um, the, the dark bars are ecology and the, the light blue bars are in evolution. This is how prevalent them are. So here we also see about 2% is fabricated data. And for example, Harking, that's the third duo, is around 50% in this study. With also unreported variables. So, so not reporting all the variables you've measured in your final paper. It's super commonly not done. And that's a problem because then you don't know how um, how valid the story is because you could just pick the variables that give a significant effect and make a beautiful story out of this all right, uh, these are all problems for uh, these are all questionable research practices uh, fabrication is worse it's not questionable it's fraud all right so these are three studies that the guidelines um, have no effect uh, g show give so these are three studies that the guidelines have no effect on. So if the purpose of the guideline is to contribute partly to increase scientific quality, maybe we should address the most prevalent problems in academia, but it's addressed quite poorly. So the fourth point of criticism uh, against the guidelines is that it will create more resistance against open science. So here I have take a here I pick points from the guidelines. These are my English translations of some points that I showed in the neutral video where I showed the, 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 the guideline points in English. And I in uh, square braces I put which section it was, for example in the open data section there was a guideline that researchers get support to make data fair from, for example, universities. For the methods, also researchers get support. And for public participation, for doing citizen science, also there is support. So, to me, you would in, this would insinuate that open science costs more time. Um, and maybe we can already agree that open science costs more time. Um, I can have a bit of a discussion on that, I won't do that here. But let's assume that just based on this paper, well, it insinuates at least that it costs more time. The question is, why do people do questionable research practices? What is the reason that people don't do high quality science? Well, this is the same paper that already showed you about uh, the 6,000 um, Dutch researchers that were interviewed. And one figure is 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 why they do it. And uh, here they they fit their model to all the data, and you have to pay attention to the first column, which is the strength of the effect. So the higher the number, um, the more or uh, the more effect it has. So a uh, number of zero means um, uh, the number of zero means that if you have this high uh, high or low value of this you will do exactly as much questionable things on this. Where if you have, for example, 0.10, it means that the more you feel this, the likelier you are you do to do questionable research practices. Work pressure too, um, the more you feel this, the more likelier you are to, to do these questionable research practices. 
and you just and I took a look at the two strongest one so the strongest one is your scientific norm um, the stronger you have this the lower you have this the lower you have this the higher question amount of questionable research practices you do that's that's what the minus does um, so if you say well science is just a game or um, the truth will expose itself in the end um, that's your that's the number one reason why people do questionable research practice the strongest effect but the second is publication pressure the more publication pressure you feel the likelier that you are to do questionable research practices so that's a bit um, that's that's a bit uh, opposite so adding more work will discourage doing open science so there's more work being added uh, you want but you want more you want better science but we know that adding more work if there's more pressure more stuff to be do you'll you'll do more sloppy research so you should not add more work you should not add more work you should make less work if you want people to do better research but of course the question is if the support actually saves time so there's support being offered and does it save time well I would conclude that support doesn't save time because if it would actually save time most scientists will do open science and this is not the case there's already support to do all these open things um, but it's more work you need to talk to them, you need to schedule things, you need to fill in forms it's not the case that it saves time it is possible that it would save time that's my personal, that I think that is true but we have to be very ruthless in um, in helping, in getting the type of support that actually saves time um, support that actually saves time is maybe is one thing that could get people over to open science if it would do so so my conclusion is that my criticism on the, the guidelines are that it's, it's super ironic that it's in Swedish and still after two months in Swedish only as if scientific policy in Sweden well that should not be uh, inclusive that should be only in Sweden um, I would say the guidelines are convincing to any critical reader there are no reference to literature whatsoever it's a l lot of fanboy statements and that's it if you take a look at the most prevalent problems in academia it nearly has no effect on it um, and because these guidelines will give you more work it will only give more resistance against open science now I do claim that there are solutions for all of these problems but again I repeat this talk is only about criticism so I won't give you the solutions to all these problems at least as my opinion um, I will leave to that I'll let, I will let my um, discussion opponent or my discussion partner um, discuss all the positive things but I won't do it I only discuss the criticism so if you agree with me or not if you think I put open science in a very bad light now well I think there are solutions but I'm not going to say them here so um, the reference to the literature well if you uh, here, here is the list and that concludes my video I wish you a very good day hey doll